All this is Dr. Mubeen Sayyad from drbean.com. Welcome to one more show. Interesting study to discuss today. It is an in vitro study, not in vivo. Plus, this is about hydroxychloroquine, which is so controversial. And um, because of that, I got to say this here, at least in the YouTube, that this is not a medical advice. This is not a prescription. Please don't take any medicine without your doctor's advice. And hydroxychloroquine is not recommended other than for clinical trials. And this is an in vitro clinical trial or study, not a trial. So we can actually discuss this here. So let's start. I am actually pretty excited. Here is why I am excited. You know that I love medical mechanisms. However, for this hydroxychloroquine, this mechanism, I had never actually thought about it. So that is my confession that I never thought that this mechanism will be possible. So let's look at this uh, new study and the mechanism. So I'm going to share my screen. So first of all, this is drbean.com. Uh, if you would like to see or watch more of these lectures, more of medical premium content, about 967 videos now, then uh, take advantage of the link in the description. It's a one-time payment of a very, very, very low price. And I think you would like it. Um, then here is the study that we are talking about. Hydroxychloroquine blocks SARS-CoV-2 entry into the endocytic pathway in mammalian cell culture. Published on 14 September, and it has been peer-reviewed and accepted. The, the work is done by a, by a research unit, which is supported by uh, NIH and US military. So if I go to funding, you would see here, this work was supported by the National Institute of Health with an R01 to SBH and the U.S. Department of Defense with an accelerating, accelerating innovation in military medicine to SBH. So this is the background of this study. Quite an, a lengthy, beautiful study, lots of mechanisms, lots of explanations. I'm going to go over the high level. And once again, I'll promise that if there is decent engagement with this video if you liked it so please like it and please place a comment so if there are a decent number of likes that means you're interested in this one then i will actually go through all the mechanisms i'm just going to go over the highlights at this time so let's start so these are our gifts for humanity they are continuing and thank you very much for supporting them if you would like to support this work there are links in the description okay So study properties, high level. It's an in vitro study. It's not in vivo. It is an accepted, published, peer-reviewed study. And here is what is important to keep in our mind. And that is, we can take this as an abstract as well. Let's see if I can actually present the abstract right now. So imagine this is a cell. On cells, on our cells, there are certain clusters of proteins. Imagine, remember there was a, a few days ago or months ago, they said that Mr. Beast and his team has started working on the garbage garbage patch in the ocean, in the seas. And he is kind of cleaning, he and his team are cleaning that those garbage patches out. Imagine those garbage patches. Imagine the sea is the cell membrane, a cell's surface. And imagine those garbage patches are actually not garbage, but these are proteins. And there are clusters of proteins floating around in our cell membranes. Please keep this imagination, this view in your mind. And now if you look here, on our cells, the heroes for the talk today. Number one, gangliosides, GM1. It is a cluster of, GM1 is a protein called ganglioside. And there is a cluster of this protein, a big patch of this protein floating around on a cell membrane. Similarly, inside the cell membrane, there are phosphatidyl inositol diphosphate or bisphosphate or PIP2, which is another set of proteins that are floating around on the inner side. So imagine if somebody has jumped in the ocean with a snorkel and now they're just they're just floating around just below the surface of the ocean and the snorkel is up there. So this 
little protein cluster is PIP2. PIP2 protein cluster is really important for cells' inner functions and the signaling transduction. Transduction means to take a message from one format to another format. This GM1 is also for cell signaling. And for the healthcare professionals and the students over here, GM1 or the ganglioside is connected to a G protein related um, receptor system. And that G protein then brings the second messenger or the, the message inside. So two things, GM1 cluster, PIP2 cluster on the cell membranes. Then the third cluster of the proteins that we are interested in today, cells have like thousands of types of protein clusters on them. So the third one are the ACE2. And we know that ACE2 are for anti-inflammatory and pro-inflammatory system, the renin angiotensin system, which is for blood pressure maintenance, cardiovascular activity maintenance, plus inflammation related. So ACE2 enzyme also has clusters on the cells. Although we also know that ACE2 is used by SARS-CoV-2 to enter the cells. Correct? So these three clusters keep in mind. Then out here, imagine there is a virus, SARS-CoV-2, that wants to enter the cell. We know these things. These are not new. The GM1 is new for us. The PIP2 in this context is new for us. ACE2 we know. The virus we know. And the third thing here, this little green hero, hydroxychloroquine. We know this as well. And we know that hydroxychloroquine has been controversial and the, there are studies that say it works and there are studies that say it doesn't work. And the authors mention that. They say that there are studies where they say that it worked in, for example, in vitro. Then when they administer that to patients, they say it, doesn't, it didn't work as we observed it in vitro, etc. So the authors try to close a gap for why it didn't work in humans or in vivo compared to in vitro. So not only we have to understand the mechanism today, the other thing that I would like you to take away today is why maybe hydroxychloroquine not be working? Why may hydroxychloroquine not be working in some patients? And why it may be useful in other patients? Once again, I'm not advising it. I'm just saying that if the clinical trials would come in, then the authors say this, that when the clinical trials occur, they should probably keep following things in mind and we would discuss them. Okay, so completing the abstract, what is the role of hydroxychloroquine here? The role of hydroxychloroquine here, the new mechanism is that it blocks the entry of SARS-CoV-2 in the cell. That is new. Previously, we had been studying, the mechanism was that hydroxychloroquine enters the cell and inside the cell there are endosomes and there are little vesicles and particles. And those little endosomes and the vesicles, they have a acidic environment in them and hydroxychloroquine goes in there and changes the acidity and that causes the function to become changed and that causes the SARS-CoV-2's own functions to become disrupted and the SARS-CoV-2 building and assembly becomes disrupted. We also have uh, read about the hydroxychloroquine and zinc and so on. So we have done all of those. I'm not repeat, going to repeat that. This is a new mechanism. And what they're saying is that instead of actually the virus getting in the cell and then hydroxy possibly disrupting it, it just reduces the entry in the cell. So it reduces the infection of the cell. Now... That's it. If you just wanted to hear what is the study about, they found for the first time that hydroxychloroquine not only has to go in the cell and change the acidity, but it can just block the entry of the virus in the cell. So then the question becomes, how? And that's what I'm going to discuss. If you just wanted to know this much, nine minutes, we're done. <laughs> Thank you very much. Links in the description if you would like to buy me a coffee or PayPal or would like to buy Dr. Bean account. So here, overview of the mechanism. 
this is a new set of concepts. So imagine here, focus here. Imagine someone has high levels of cholesterol. So high levels of close cholesterol are found in obese people. High levels of cholesterol can actually be um, actually be present in the lungs of obese people even when they have become lost a little weight. The lung tissue can hold on to the extra cholesterol and have it in their membranes. And cholesterol is actually an essential part of our cell's normal functioning. So it's not a bad thing, but high level cholesterol is a different situation. So, and I know that some folks would say, we, I was discussing with Dr. Paul Merrick and we were discussing, was it really, really bad or not bad? Here in this context, high level cholesterol and the viral entry is what we are going to discuss. So here, this part, this little GM1 protein cluster. So not just one, a whole cluster here. First concept coming your way. As you encounter, as you have high cholesterol level in the cell and in the membranes of the cells, the ACE2 enzymes start attract, getting attracted to the GM1. This is such a beautiful thing. So when a cell is living in a high cholesterol environment, the ACE2 enzymes, they become associated with the cluster of the... I need to figure out when will this thing work. One second, please. My... Okay, so something happened. My apologies, back here. All right, so when the cholesterol levels are high, when the environment is rich in cholesterol, then the ACE2 enzymes become associated with GM1. And the question should be in your mind that why is this bad or good? What does it mean? GM1 or ganglioside 1 is associated with endocytosis. Endocytosis is for the cell to pick up something from outside, create a pocket around it and take it in. I actually discussed that a few days ago with the immunology topics as well, the function of the immunology. I believe I discussed it in the second video. So imagine if I give you an example here, because this is the crux of the, di the discussion. So imagine I am a cell and this is my membrane. And this little tiny monster is a virus. And this area is GM1 cluster. When the virus attaches to the GM1 cluster, this whole area of the membrane is engulfed and brought in the cell. That is what is called endocytosis. So what, what is the result then? High cholesterol level associates the ACE2 enzyme to the GM1. GM1 by nature create endocytosis. That means if the virus attaches here to this ACE2, the ACE2 that is near GM1, then GM1 would help the virus and the ACE2 to get into the cell through the mechanism of endocytosis. I, and I should share my screen. Through the mechanism of endocytosis. Now, we know that the there is another mechanism of cell entry, and that is is the virus attaches to the ACE2, then there is TMPRSS2 that would prime the, mem uh, the spike protein, and then the virus would fuse with the cell membrane and the RNA would go into the cell. Let's call that cell surface binding or fusion, cell surface fusion. That's what authors said in their discussion. So there are two entry mechanisms. 
mechanism of the cell virus entry into the cell via endocytosis and mechanism of virus entry into the cell via binding with ACE2, getting primed and then fusing with the cell membrane. So cell surface and endocytosis, two mechanisms. So when cholesterol levels are high, endocytosis increases. An endocytotic mechanism is more prone for higher rate of entry compared to the cell surface. And the authors mentioned that Omicron is known to have more endocytotic activity as well in addition to the cell surface entry. And that is why Omicron is becoming more infectious. Good. So if I go back here now, high cholesterol level pulls like a magnet, binds the GM1 and ACE2s to each other, they become co-located and that increases the endocytosis, that increases the infectivity, that means obese individuals. And they did this test on the cells from the lungs of the obese individuals plus on the cells that were um, enriched with cholesterol artificially. They did this and they found this to be true. So high cholesterol levels. Okay, I want to continue. Low cholesterol level. They also called it in their manuscript as resting cell. Low cholesterol level causes the opposite. It causes the ACE2, not opposite in terms of viral entry, but it causes the ACE2 to become co-located with PIP2. So imagine now there are two people standing on a side and there is a little person standing in the middle. Let's say two parents, mother and father and a child in the middle. If there is high cholesterol, then the child is attracted towards the parent. If there is low cholesterol, then the child is attracted towards the mother. So here the mother and father are GM1 and PIP2. So when the cholesterol, <laughs> excuse me, cholesterol levels are lower, then ACE2 start co-locating with PIP2. PIP2 are also somewhat endocytotic, not a lot. Not as well endocytotic as GM1. But still they are. So that means that can also cause infectivity. That means high cholesterol levels and low cholesterol levels both can do it, but high cholesterol levels will do it more. Good so far? Now, enter hydroxychloroquine. This is such a magical thing. They, they said that it has the same behavior as anesthetics as well. And they have actually given examples of certain anesthetics that do that too. Here is what hydroxychloroquine does. This is outside the cell. This There is nothing to, about the hydroxy in the cell and doing the pH changes. This is outside the cell. What does it do? Here is what it does. Hydroxychloroquine dislocates the ACE2. So if you see here, this is hydroxychloroquine hanging with the ACE2. It moves it away from both of these clusters. And the authors say that we thought it will move them away from GM1 towards more PIP2. But they found out that not only it removed that, dislocated it, moved it away from GM1, it also moved it away from PIP2. So imagine there are patches of the, the, the proteins and the ACE2 are now co-located with the parent protein or the mother protein. And then comes the hydroxychloroquine and holds the child's hand and takes it all the way somewhere else. So then the question is why? How does it do it? And that is because of the electromagnetic forces on ACQ and the way it behaves with the, um, with the other cholesterol molecules and with GM1 and PIP2. And they were able to actually measure the distance it would move ACE2 away from these two guys, GM1 and PIP2. How, 
how sophisticated the science has become. And it was, but it is just leaps and bound moving forward. They could actually measure the distance for the travel of the ACE2s away from DM1 and PIP2. And do you know what that means also? They also proved something that was so interesting that once it moves away, then the endocytotic pathway became negligible. The entry of the virus in the cell through the endocytosis went away. The infectivity reduced. Why? Because when the cell, the ACE2s have become, they called it disordered region. Disordered region is when the ACE2s have moved away from GM1 and PIP2. When the child has moved away from both parents and is now located at a third place. They call that third place as disordered region. ACE2 should not be there, but they are there. Hydroxy has caused that disorder. And now the only way for these crying little viruses to enter the cell is through the surface fusion. Binding with the ACE2, getting primed by TMPRSS2, then binding with the cell membrane and fusing and releasing RNA inside. And they showed in their study, again, this is an in vitro study, they showed that the infectivity reduced significantly. And in one case, uh, in the HEK cells, the infectivity reduced by 72% or more. That was just such an interesting mechanism. I cannot pass up on discussing this mechanism. I totally understand that YouTube can come and hammer this and the whole channel, they've already given me a strike. But this is still a study. We're talking about a study in vitro. So what is the takeaway? If you had to say one sentence about this study today, what is that one sentence? That one sentence is a new mechanism for hydroxychloroquine that it moves ACE2 enzyme away from GM1 and GM and PIP2, which causes hindrance or blocks the viral entry through the endocytosis. That reduces the infectivity. Beautiful mechanism. So cell surface entry is still possible. Binding of the virus to the AS2, then getting primed and everything, that is still possible. Now, they say it repeatedly in their manuscript, this mechanism was not known. All the conjectures, speculations, methods, mechanisms observed were inside the SQ present inside the cell. And then changing the acidities and zinc channels and all that. And here they're seeing it's hydroxy. Do, do you like this diagram? I think this diagram makes a lot of sense. Hydroxy is kind of pulling the ACE2 away from these two guys. Okay, so I'm now enjoying this. <laughs> some notes. It's a long study, and I'm going to go over some of the uh, figures as well. Please like, subscribe, and share, and please like and comment so I can actually see if there is an interest and I'll do it again. I sometimes find that if the interest is not there, then pushing the same video with more elaboration is kind of wasting your time. Okay. Some more notes. Number one, they did this, they increased the cholesterol. This is again in vitro. And so they mentioned that APOE, APOE, that is another enzyme, APOE, whose job is to pump the cholesterol inwards toward a cell or remove it, depending upon what is the cholesterol levels in the body. So they used APOE, enriched the environment around the cells with the cholesterol, and the cell became cholesterol rich. They took up a lot of cholesterol. And guess what happened? the infectivity started happening through endocytosis. That means when they gave cholesterol to this structure, then the cholesterol started moving these ACE2s back here with these guys. And as soon as 
the ACE2 started co-locating or clustering with GM1, the viral entry through the endocytotic pathway started occurring. Infectivity increased. So they said, maybe in the future studies, instead of just saying that, let me give hydroxychloroquine and see what happens, look at the cholesterol profile. And they said it is not about the cholesterol profile in the blood, but instead in the tissue cells. Because he said they say that the cholesterol levels in the tissues can be different and misrepresented by the circulation. So they said there could be more studies to check the cholesterol levels and hydroxy's function aligned to that. So they said one of the speculation they have is that probably the inconsistency in hydroxy's mechanism was because hydroxy was being given to healthy individuals who may not have a disrupted cholesterol uh, level. But if it was given to obese or if, if it was given to folks who are already in a severe state, that means there is some cholesterol level related dysregulation, then it may have been a different outcome. Again, that is their point of view. Okay, so that is one note. Another, if you read here, previous studies have sought to address the discrepancy between in vitro and in, in vivo experiments with hydroxy. The partitioning of hydroxy in negative. So here, what they're talking about is that I had discussed in the past as well, that hydroxy changes the, the positivity or the acidity, and it can become partitioned based on the charges on the molecules and the endosomes. And they said that is the kind of mechanisms people were working with. Here they said, for example, lung cells and monkeys studies showed no reduced effect in using hydroxy in low cholesterol state, but it does not reflect the risk of an obese patient has of death from severe COVID, nor the potential of hydroxy to affect ACE2 in a high cholesterol state. So this is the other thing to keep in mind. Then they talk about Omicron and they say, the more recent Omicron variant has been shown to enter primarily through the endocytic pathway. The Omicron variant is also more infectious in children and healthy adults, further supporting our findings here that moving the virus into the endocytic pathway increases infectivity. So they're saying that, look, if cholesterol levels are high and the endocytic pathway is working more, then that is more infective pathway. And they said, we can give you now an example because Omicron, regardless of cholesterol, is able to start entering through the endocytic pathways and it has become higher, more intense in infectivity. You know, that also means that if they did clinical trials now with Omicron, they might actually find hydroxy to be even more valuable than the previous variants. Then they say stratifying patients meaning making their groups, separate them out according to some properties, stratifying patients by the level of lung cholesterol, not blood cholesterol, may reveal a benefit for hydroxy and help avoid potential toxicity of hydroxy in some cell types. And then they say that the blood is primarily a transient transport system and thus may not accurately predict years of accumulation in the lung of obese or chronically inflamed patients. Isn't this a beautiful mechanism? And now let me go over some of the figures so that we can see this. Let me go to the next one. This is actually a beautiful figure. So let's look at this one. Here, what they're showing is the following. Let's start from the bottom. These blackish or darker area of the cell membrane is the GM1 cluster, bigger garbage patch. <laughs> and they say that ACE2 when present here, see they show a little dimple here they said this is an endocytotic pathway. 
So if the virus attaches here, virus is going to get in. Then here, if you see, this is these little parts on the inner side of the cell. This is the inner side. This is PIP2, phosphatidyl inositol 4, 5, bisphosphate, PIP2. This one also has the ACE2 attached to it. And then look at this little hexagon. This is hydroxy. They said we actually thought that if we give hydroxy, hydroxy will move the ACE2 from GM1 to PIP2 because these are the two patches that attract ACE2. But they found that it actually moved them away, the ACE2 away from both patches and brought it in another region, empty region, and they called that region as disor disordered region. Here they have various cell lines and the presence of hydroxy in the control versus, sorry, presence of the viruses in the control versus in the hydroxy treated cells. So this is also a beautiful um, figure. Then I wanted to share figure five. This is three. If you see here, this is also about how the hydroxy moves and how much it moves and if the data is significant or not. But figure five is interesting. I'm going to go there. I did my homework though. <laughs> so this is the figure five here at a high level. Check this out. And this is the last part and then we stop. So here, look at A. In the A, this is a PIP2 cluster. This is the ACE2 over here. And the virus can bind here and be endocytosed. GM1 is actually a better endocytotic pathway or cytocytic pathway. If the virus is not able to bind to ACE2 over there, then it can do membrane fusion, as we know. Even with the PIP2, it could do more membrane fusion as well. Then here... If you see, this is the GM1. And with the GM1, it actually does deterministic endocytosis. It actually does endocytosis as compared to PIP2 or just the AS2, which moves more towards cell surface. So here you see this little pouch. This is the endocytic vacuole forming. So this is GM1. There is AS2 over here. AS2 is binding with the virus, then the, a pocket appears and the whole thing is pinched in. Then this is that little garbage patch analogy. This is a cell membrane surface and then the dark spots are the GM1s and the yellow ones are the uh, PIP2 and then the little sun-like things are the SARS-CoV-2. And the as the hydroxychloroquine comes in, that disrupts the binding and reduces the infectivity. So that is also a beautiful diagram. So this is the discussion. I really enjoyed this uh, mechanism. So please like, subscribe, and share if you would like to support this work. It seems like uh, YouTube has actually shadow banned us from some days. I do not know when, maybe the Lancet discussion, but the notifications are not reaching to people in time. For example, I started today at 5 and many people actually not didn't get the notification and got it 5.30, 5.40 and so on. So please uh, like, subscribe and share. Maybe that would change the algorithm's mind that if more people are interacting. And in addition to that, if you would like to support this work, there are links in the description. You can buy me a coffee or you can use PayPal or you can become part of patrons. Patrons, you can become part of pat Patreon by $5.00. A month or you can become part of substack or locals or you can purchase a dr bean plan as well it's under hundred dollars and it is a lot of videos there so it has a lot of videos with this thank you very much and nev nevthia says thank you we appreciate it. you are very welcome casey says thank you you're very welcome the pandemic's over yes pandemic's over yes i think so we should so would these results cause the medical community to rethink statins in the core i think so and hydroxy and uh, 
probably even for the future, the coronavirus is related. Um, um for their discussions john says dr bean did the study also have quercetin in it or just just the hydroxychloroquine because it is it doesn't even need to go in to do anything it is standing outside and doing it <laughs> then imagine quercetin and zinc and all that and again <laughs> nipa says we started with weekly hydroxy before we learned about ivermectin from elections and got no prevention but during the attack took both along with supplements and doxy thank you also i forgot to show, show one more thing this is such an important thing because there was so much contention about remember <laughs> excuse me Remember azithromycin? There is so much of a uh, fight going on that this is an antibacterial. Why are you doing it for this? And then doctors say, well, this can be anti-inflammatory here as well. Check this out. Erythromycin inhibits viral entry through perturbing, perturbing GM1 clusters as well. So azithromycin is an antibiotic derived from erythromycin that is sometimes given in combination with hydroxy. Although azithromycin has shown antiviral properties in numerous studies, the results of its usage with COVID-19 patients in combination with hydroxy have been mixed. Based on the cholesterol sensitivity of SARS-CoV-2, we hypothesize that the erythromycin could contribute to an antiviral effect through disruption of GM1 cluster, leading us to test its efficacy. So they said we found erythromycin, 100 microgram per milliliter, significantly inhibits SARS-CoV-2 pseudovirion infection, 69 plus minus 17% in HEK293 T cells, overexpressing ACE2 at normal cholesterol level, normal cholesterol levels. So azithromycin also disrupt the, the parent patch, for example, and allows the endocytosis to be blocked. So I actually wanted to title this video as Hydroxy and Azithromycin Block Viral Entry. So John says, would lipoprotein impact this mechanism possibly through the cholesterol, but not directly? John says, several states passed laws allowing hydroxychloroquine. Yes, I'm aware of them. Thank you, John, for bringing that up. <laughs> Don has a very good question. If there's no pandemic, then there is no emergency. So EUA is gone, correct? <laughs> Well, I think that they are, they can do what they want. So this is the discussion. Please like, subscribe, and share. Please support this work. There are links in the description. And I would see you tomorrow. Bye-bye for now. I broke my rule today that today and tomorrow we were going to talk about immunology and then the other things. But this is just such an important study. Tomorrow, if you like, instead of immunology, we can do immunology later in the week. We can do another video about antibody-dependent enhancement. So there is a now proof, there's a study out that actually shows with proof that ADE can occur with antibodies, both from the monoclonals and from the vaccine-generated. I would actually add that even repeated infection-generated um, antibodies would do that too. So if you would like, we can discuss that tomorrow. Let me know. Bye-bye for now.